feel like I'm on American Idol or something. This is incredible. The judges, please leave the room. Good stuff, man. That's never happened before. What was it, like 30 judges? Poor guys. So uh, it's been an adventure. You know, I, I tell myself I'm going to stop speaking places and chill out, and then things like this come up. And I love Jill's and Marsh. Let's hear it for Jill's. Jill's is a class act, a role model, and he's, he's a mentor that you can look after that's been in the trenches, served people, and chiropractic actually saved his life. If you don't know his story, if he chooses to share it, it's an amazing story, rocked my world when I heard it, and it just solidified my belief in this universal innate intelligence thing that we talk about in chiropractic. In my world, that's all I know about is innate intelligence. You know, I'm not the brightest guy on, on earth, when that young girl had the A-plus up there on the paper, I got chills because I was sliding by with C's, man. I'd go to the wall of shame at life and just hope I passed. You know, I was an English major in college. My dream was to be a professional baseball player. I was getting looked at by the Red Sox, White Sox, Royals in high school. I was a pitcher. And then I tore my rotator cuff, and my dream disappeared like that. And I really don't know what I wanted to do in my life, so I became a bouncer and a bartender in the Bronx. Pretty good uh, go-to. And uh, you know, my mother, she, she ended up divorced and she started working part-time for a chiropractor. So she'd come home and punch me in the chest and say, you're gonna be a chiropractor. I'm like, I'm not smart enough to be a chiropractor. Are you kidding me? They're like doctors and stuff. So uh, it turned out, you know, one day I was just feeling sorry for myself. I'm driving through the Bronx in my Jeep and a guy jumps in my Jeep and he says, uh, can you give me a ride? And I looked at him, he was in a nice suit, he was just off the train, and I said, sure. So we start driving, and he starts telling me the story about, I said, where are we going? He said, I'm going to see my chiropractor. I'm like, well, that's a coincidence. And he starts telling me how his chiropractor changed, saved his life. I didn't hear anything after that, I was numb, you know, because I, I believe in this thing called God and nothing happens by chance, and I felt like that was something tapping me on the shoulder. Three days later, I'm hanging out with my girlfriend, a couple fraternity brothers, and we're watching uh, a movie, Jacob's Ladder. I was posing for you, man. Jacob's Ladder. And there's a scene in Jacob's Ladder where uh, the chiropractor goes in the hospital in the emergency room and, and rips his patient out of there, brings him back to his office, adjusts him. And I was, I was crying in front of men that I shouldn't be crying in front of. And I decided right then and there I was going to be a chiropractor. And let me tell you something. Coming out here this morning, I want, to, I want to apologize to the speakers this morning because two things are happening this weekend. I like to come and hang out and listen to everybody. I don't like to go in, speak, and get out. That's not me. But I got delayed five hours hanging out in Bradley Airport this morning. And they kept saying it's coming, coming, coming. It wasn't coming. So I hung out in the airport and drank a lot of coffee. And tomorrow I got to leave early because my six-year-old daughter's got a dance recital and she wants me there. So I'm on an early flight to go see JJ dance. But I walked in this hotel and I walked around the elevators and I see the escalators. And I got freaking chills. Because it's in this building, actually in this room, if you flip it around, that in 1994, I came to a conference here called Dynamic Essentials. And it was the end of my first quarter of school, and I, I, didn't really, I didn't know what chiropractic was, I didn't know who I was, I didn't know what my passion purpose was. And five times, I went into the bathroom and took a picture of the urinals, five times I walked out of the room and headed for those escalators right out there. Because I was terrified, why? Because grown men were hugging each other. I'm like, these guys are a bunch of Fruit Loops. <laughs> they're on chairs, they're screaming, they're yelling, they're fired up, and I'm thinking, these guys are on crack. <laughs> and I literally, I do not lie, I started walking out of the room, and then I would make a right-hand turn to the men's room, and I would go in there, and I was sweating. And I'm like, man, this is, this is tougher than being in a barroom brawl. And then a man got up, in the, and I'm standing in the back of the room because when they would turn and say, hug the person to your right, I would kind of slip away. I'm like, you're not touching me. <laughs> and this dude gets up from Spartanburg, South Carolina, like the Michael Kale, and he starts talking about the brain stem. He starts talking about the atlas. He starts talking about B.J. Palmer. Get off your phone. He starts talking about this thing called chiropractic and the principle. 
And then he starts talking about Clearview Sanitarium. Who here has not heard of Clearview Sanitarium? Amen. Because when I was in school, no one heard of it. Doctors in the room didn't hear of it. And Dr. Kale's talking about volume 18 and the upper cervical work and the principle that lies within those pages. And Clearview Sanitarium was a chiropractic psychiatric hospital where they were taking care of bipolar, schizophrenic, manic depressive people. How many people in this room know someone or someone they really love that's got at least anxiety or depression? Most. Uh, a big model just jumped out of a, a window in Manhattan with her baby in her arms today because she's going through a divorce and killed both of them. We can't take this stuff lightly. So Kale starts getting up there and talking to me about Clearview Sanitarium and I froze. I couldn't move. I started crying. And it was that God moment of, this is why you're here and this is why you're doing this. Why? Because my older brother Ronnie was all world to me. Went to University of Pennsylvania, pitched a no-hitter against Yale, was getting looked at by professional baseball teams, was a starting linebacker for the football team, spoke three fluent languages, had a 3.7 average. The dude was a stud. Took a hit the wrong way in practice one day. Woke up in a hospital. They were doing open field tackling drills. They put him against a 285-pound lineman and ran 40 yards apart, head on into each other. That's pretty smart. Snapped his neck just the wrong way. X-rays, MRIs, CAT scans were all negative. They sent him back to school with a neck brace and three medications. They said, you're lucky you weren't paralyzed, let alone killed, and you'll be okay. Kumbaya. He started getting sick all the time. Six months after the incident, they took his tonsils out. Didn't change much. He couldn't remember his languages. He was having a hard time focusing his grades started dropping. He couldn't sleep. He started going out to bars and drinking because he just wasn't feeling right. He felt disconnected. And no one knew what was going on. My father, you know, they took him to, to doctors and neurologists and all these people, and they said, we don't know what's going on. He's fine. He's just going through some stress. Maybe it's an Ivy League school. Bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. Until one day in the middle of the night, he shows up at home. He jumped on a train and came home with nothing but his jacket and jeans and said, something's not right, I need help. So they take him to one of the top psychiatrists in New York at Cornell Medical. They do a five-hour exam on him. This, I'll never forget it, the doctor coming out and saying, there's nothing wrong with this kid. You don't want to ruin an Ivy League education. Send him back. Have a little tough love. So my parents did it. Hours later, we get a call from the South Philly police. He got off a train, he walked up to a gang, challenged them all to a fight. The head of the gang called the cops on him. They took him away, put him in a psychiatric hospital, and he never got out. The rest of high school and college, I would go to different facilities, whether it was a psychiatric hospital, halfway houses, to visit my brother. Because I thought, everyone just thought he just snapped or something. Until in 1994, it took a southern boy to tell me the truth. It took me showing up to this thing that I had no idea what it was. And people were getting up there and talking about all these people they see, thousands a week in their office. You know, there's a lot of talk going on in chiropractic now that it's not about volume. I disagree. Because if this thing is so big and you're telling the truth and you're talking the tick, they're knocking down your door. You can't keep them away. The families are coming in. Your biggest problem should be, how do I move quicker and then how many docs do I bring in to help me? So when I walked out of that room, I waited for that man because hundreds of doctors lined up to get adjusted by him. And I asked myself, how come everybody's not doing this? They all thought he was the best. And I learned because it took a lot of training and a lot of certainty to do this stuff. And I think there was personality issues too. In chiropractic, we have a lot of personality differences. You guys see that? And I think it's time to get over it. It's time to mend the fences. It's time to band together and cut the crap and let's get together to make a change once and for all in society. <laughs> Listen, I get invited to go speak places and they're like, well, you're gonna represent DE, you're a DE guy. I'm not, I'm a freaking chiropractor. Let's stop dividing each other by these titles we feel like we have to have. 
right? I got my daughter, Sierra, is a freshman in high school. She's already picked out her number she wants to be when she comes to life as a soccer player. She's got Duke, she's got Penn State, she's got these big colleges looking at her already as a freshman. And she says, Dad, I just don't know. Since she's four years old, she wants to be a chiropractor. <coughs> so we got to get over ourselves with that and get on the mission because you know what? People are jumping out of windows because they're having a bad day. And I take that personally because I know we can help. Connected people don't kill themselves. Connected people don't give their kids drugs. Connected people aren't depressed and anxious and sad. Connected people don't have a hard time having a baby. Connected people don't get divorced. Yeah, I got five kids. I played a little role. I made love for a couple hours. <laughs> my, wife's a, my wife's a pediatric nurse. And when I met her, people were like, that's not going to last because I was wild back in the day. I'm calm now. <laughs> and, you know, I was like, well, Reggie Gold's wife, Irene, is a nurse, and they did it right. But I had to pass the test, and that was bringing her to DE. She sat in the third row. She was having a good time. And I hadn't adjusted her yet because I wanted her to earn it. <laughs> and Cliff Hardick gets up there and starts going nuts and bashing medicine and talking about how many people medicine's killing and lives they're destroying. And he's screaming right at my wife. He didn't know her. <laughs> and I'm like, well, there goes this one. She elbows me and says, you know what the problem is in this room? And I'm like, here we go. She said, I'm the only one that hasn't been adjusted. And she hasn't looked back. And what this afforded me, this space, and whatever space you choose to be in, is this woman that I knew was my soulmate was I needed help that she had to be on mission with me. Because I knew I was going to be wild. And I knew I was going to be taking care of the masses. And I knew there was going to be people that aren't going to like me. But I needed a studette next to me. And I pointed out six or seven doctors and I said, go ask them every question you have. And there she is with Dr. Plummer in the corner just talking. And I could see her head and I'm like, oh God, I hope he says the right thing. Then I see her with Sigafoos and then Joe Accurso. And then I see her just like, let the conversations get shorter. And she starts to cry. And she said, how come more people don't know about this? I'm here to tell you, gang, if my family knew about this, my Ronnie, he would still be, he's still alive. I just visited him the other day. He's such a gentle spirit, gentle soul. Just sitting there talking with him, it's like, you know, he could help my son learn how to pitch because he was a better pitcher than me. He could teach my son how to hit in football because he was tougher than me, but it can't happen. They put him on so many drugs and medication through the years, they've pulled all his teeth out. Try sitting across a table with your 51-year-old brother and he's talking to you like a 90-year-old man. All freaking gums because of what these bastards have done to him. But it's not their fault. It's our fault as a profession. And I'm here to say it's a time to get out our head out of our ass and stop fighting each other and bring it to the people. And to me, that's what... And listen, I apologize to the leaders here because I'm getting a little foul mouth and I ask God to forgive me, but, you know, with all due respect. And I didn't ask to write a book. I'm not here to sell a book. I didn't bring books. I'm not here to sell you a darn thing. But other than to maybe find a space in your heart where you could take this thing serious. Become masters at adjusting, detecting, correcting subluxations. Know what's going on up here, man. You just can't take a neck and crack it to the left and right and expect a miracle. You'll get people well. But we need, like, the Navy SEALs in the profession that are training, that are scanning. They know when to adjust someone, when not to adjust someone. When a mom, you know, I look at that little baby up there and I smile because I did that same picture with all five kids on the little white rug, naked. <laughs> you know, and now they're like, Kylie's 16. She's an all-state runner. She's going to the States for running. Sierra's a national soccer player. She, her team just made for the, the first team out of her organization to make the, the finals tournament in Seattle this summer. It's just like you wake up and that little thing becomes something. And we have a part in what that thing's going to become. 
They're gonna either be connected or disconnected. And disconnected kids are in trouble. And I got a big mouth in town. We've lost friends. I go to a dinner party, whatever, and there's drugs on the table. We went to a, a friend's house once, my wife's friend, childhood friend, wasn't really a friend of mine. And they got cough medicine on the counter and they use it to help their kid go to sleep. And I almost got into a fight with her husband by questioning it. And he says, I know you're into that voodoo shit. And I said, I'm also into knocking people out. And you're drugging your, you're drugging your kid. That's unacceptable. Well, guess what? The kid ended up with seizures, and I started adjusting them, and the kid got better. The universe works in weird ways. Not that I wanted it that way. But my two cents with coming here and flying in and flying out is this is not about me. Is I've, through my pain and struggles, God has given me a platform for a message. I didn't make this up. Chiropractic's been around over 120 years, and we're just not doing it. We're great with quotes with each other. We're great with saying we're going to empty the prisons, the hospitals, and everything. They're adding on to them, guys. Right? They're adding on to them. So instead of just trying to stand out and say, well, I'm this kind of chiropractor, I'm this kind of chiropractor, I'm a principal chiropractor, I'm an up, just let's be chiropractors. And let's agree that subluxations suck. Subluxations take people's life away. And there is one profession that corrects that, and that's us. And if you dilute it with anything else, the patient's going to think it was something else. And then they're gone. But when they understand that true healing comes from within, not from without, not from a pill, potion, lotion, not from a stretch, not from a rolling pillow, but from within and from getting clear, they wake up. And when they wake up, guess what? I don't take appointments in my office. The first two to three months, we guide them, then you're on your own. If you don't want to be here, leave. But we educate the heck out of them. And they just keep showing up. Keep showing up. Now listen, there was a time where we were seeing about 1,000 a week at our office, and a chiropractor came up to me once at a conference, and he just put his hands on my hips. He says, you're going to have to chill out soon because you don't want to lose your kids in this whole thing. And I went, ah, yeah, because my ego was big because I was seeing a lot of people. And then it was the decision of, well, we got a soccer game Saturday. Well, I got 130 people on the books. I got to take care of those people. And I had to make a choice to leave the office early. I had to make a choice that if I leave the office, maybe we see half the amount of people right now. Because my kids come first. Because I absolutely adore my kids. And we get one shot with our kids. And our job is to teach this same principle we're raising our kids, or the future kids you have, is to teach that to our community. Reckless abandon. Dick Santo talks about the wolves. We're a pack of wolves. And then society comes around, you know, you're in school and you're all fired up and then we get out there and you start billing insurance and you're like, oh, I could code this, I could code this, and they put a noose around your neck and you become a dog. And people start telling you to sit, lay down, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can only see them 11 visits. Who loses out? The people. And that's what we need to stop. We need a freaking pack of wolves coming out that want to take care of people because they realize that they deserve the right to live clear for the rest of their life. And only chiropractic could do that. You want research? Talk to the, the billions of people who have been adjusted over the past 120 years. That's more research than any medical community in the world. Top it. Live human beings. <coughs> cool, I'm good. Do the research, the, all the stuff they're doing. I'm all for it. But the reality is our malpractice insurance is really low. We're really safe, and people get well. I spoke at the University of Bridgeport. They told me I would never speak there, and some quiet girl weaseled me in there. And one of the heads of the school sat in there and started heckling me. So I told the group, I practice, what's the word they use there? Evidence-based chiropractic. I adjust my patients, they get well, that's my evidence. And he punched the desk, he got mad, and I told him, get out of the room. And he packed his stuff up and he left. Guys, listen, our fight is not here, our fight is out there. Your biggest fight is in here. You gotta take the thought from here and find the feeling here. When you find the feeling here, you're gonna find your mission, purpose, and passion in life and you become freaking unstoppable.
And when that happens and you follow your spirit, you follow your innate, and you go out there and kick ass, people aren't jumping out of windows, and chiropractic becomes the destiny that God always intended it to be. I love and appreciate you. Thank you. Yeah.